Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. See some people still sneaking in, but uh, thanks for coming. The roads are better today than they have been the past few weeks. I think the, the last couple of weeks there have been school cancellations and ice and everything else, and I figured it was because I'm a meteorologist that I get stuck with the bad, bad hand, but today was much better, so we'll take it, uh, and, and we've got a, a, bunch of, a bunch of you here in a good group. So uh, again, today's uh, session's on soil management. Um, and SARE is our sponsor today, so SARE's uh, Sustainable Ag Research Education. It's a kind of a group uh, they put together to help with sustainable agriculture and a big push on soil health and cover crops. So uh, we thank them for that. A um, couple things, if you haven't, uh, if this is your first time here, I'm, I'm Tyler Williams. I'm the Extension Educator. I'm located here in Lancaster County, but I serve Lancaster, Cass, and Odo counties uh, as well. So um, the restrooms are down the hall, if you didn't catch that, and hopefully you found the the snacks and coffee in the back, as well as the CCA sign-in sheet if you have CCA or need CCA credits. Uh, but today, yeah, we have a good good lineup. Uh, first up, we have Aaron Hurd, a state soil health specialist. Many of you have probably seen him around at a lot of things this winter. He, he, he does this a lot, so he's, uh, we're glad we could get him. Um, and Corey Schmidt was going to be here. Uh, you may have seen that. Uh, he uh, emailed this morning, he's not feeling good. So um, we don't want him here if he's not feeling good. So. We're glad that, and maybe he'll jump online and watch from there. So, and then we have uh, Fernanda Krupek with, uh, uh, with UNL as well. And so we'll have a, a number of good uh, people here today talking about everything soil health, uh, soil management, cover crops, and hopefully you can pick up a few things. And as always, please uh, you know, feel free to ask questions, kind of jump in as we go along. We're, we're a pretty informal group. Uh, we do have people that watch online, so we'll, we'll try to repeat questions and things like that so they can get a decent experience online. Um, yeah, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. And Well, thanks a lot, Tyler. I really appreciate the introduction, and thanks for having us. We're really pleased to be here, and thank you all for coming. I think it's a, a pretty neat thing that we can still be learning about this process and the system that we, that we manage and, and are stewards of. I think it's a, a, a big deal. I'm really passionate about it. Um, my name is Aaron Hurd. I'm the state soil health specialist. I grew up north of Kearney, Nebraska in Litchfield, and I went to Shadron State College and I got an environmental biology degree out there, a wildlife management minor and a plant science minor. And I started my career with the NRCS right after college in, in New Mexico. I was a range management specialist down there. I worked predominantly on the Navajo um, reservation in northwest New Mexico for six years and worked on some big, big ranches down there. That's, that's big country. Um, when I first drove into it, I said, what are these cows eating? Rocks? Um, about 200 acres per cow is the starting stocking rate. And they pretty much eat on the jog. They've got to go two miles out for a bite to eat and two miles back for the water. And it's, it's pretty, pretty tough country, but by the time I was done, I went, wow, look at that plant, that plant, that plant. And their plants are so much more protein dense that a, a cow, a bite there is worth 10 bites here. So I started learning about plant, plants and ecology and, and the function of conservation on the ground. I saw the wettest six months on record when I first moved there, and I saw the driest six months on record. We went from 23 inches of rain to complete drought in New Mexico that year, 2006. It was pretty phenomenal to see those arroyos run. And it just made me think about the environment and, and what we're experiencing, extremely, extremely bad weather. And I like to start right here. I think we've heard it and heard it and heard it, extreme weather, extreme weather. Well, I had an opportunity to move back to Nebraska in 2012. I started as a resource conservationist there in Hebron, and I ran a field office in Thayer County. And I worked with farmers there. When I got there, there was one cover crop application contract on the books, and, and I went and learned with that guy. I said, you know, this is something new. NRCS in 2010 kicked off the Unlock the Secrets of Your Soil campaign, and we really just dove in to figure this out. And the best way for me to learn is right alongside of a farmer, right there on the ground. I truly believe that, and that's what I'm going to try and portray today. Oddly, in 2015, um, Hebron experienced a 15-inch rain event in one night. And I went, this is extreme weather. And it was actually five three-inch rains, one after another after another. It was like a train coming down the tracks. You just couldn't stop it. 
And those rainstorms just kept stacking up, stacking up. And a farmer told me, I, unbeknownst to me, part of the scope of the NRCS got wider for me that day. They said, you need to go out and do a damage assessment. So that's part of NRCS's job is to, to send a report back to the state office so that we can respond to the state government and to the media about, about damage and, and total damage. So I went around and got to take a whole bunch of pictures. That was pretty fun. Um, the only one I allowed out on the road sometimes, and, and it, was, it was a neat opportunity. I saw a lot of extreme weather. And so I have these pictures here. That spring, the corn was already planted. I took this a couple months after. You know, that, that's the top of a hill. It's 1% to 3% slope, and that crop drowned out right there. You know, we saw water in places we'd never seen water before. Saturated soils where normally we don't get that, that much water. So here, different place, top of a hill, and it droughted out. And I went, we just received almost all the water we needed for a whole season. And then come July, we've got crops droughting out. That's some extreme weather. I just kept telling myself that. The ground cracked. We got like one inch cracks. That, that clay, it'll crack and look pretty, it, it exaggerates the situation, but you can, you can sure see when it's dry. You know, and I took a, a picture, or this picture here, it's a watershed about 40 acres. It's just a little part of a pivot, and the water was really moving and formed a pretty good goalie. You know, that's, that's what we saw time after time after time. Well, let's go forward a couple more years. 2019 came around. Two-thirds of the state saw that. That was a big, big storm, and all of our river systems were flooded, and the floodplains flooded, but the uplands, that's where it was widespread damage. We saw a lot of erosion in places that we had never seen erosion before. All the things that I heard in 2019 really resonated with me from 2015. And these pictures and this concept. I took this picture in 2015 there in Thayer County. That waterway had gotten taken out, removed the grass, and he'd planted a cover crop there the fall before of 14. He had just terminated that cover crop, and then we got that 15 inch rain. And it drains two pivots, 230 acres goes through that draw. He gained soil right there, six inches of soil got caught in that cover crop, protected the bottom. He didn't have a 40 by 40 goalie running through there. No erosion. And I went, that's different. He does, it's not gonna cost him any dirt work. That was a temporary grass waterway. He doesn't have to repair his grass waterway. He'll just plant another cover crop or farm through it. But annually, he's been planting a cover crop there, continuing on to protect that, that concentrated flow area with a cover crop. Huh, I started to learn that cover crops can be used as a tool, kind of like pounding a, a nail in with a pair of pliers. Here's a hammer. Let's just pound the nail in. Let's fix the problem. And so critical area treatment in response to extreme weather can be a really useful tool for cover crops. But then I had an, an awe-inspiring op opportunity to inspect a field in 2017 during a drought and this guy had planted cover crops ahead of this corn, which we're not a big fan of because it ties up a little bit of nutrients. Well, he went ahead and put starter on for the first time, and he had the best um, harvest, best yield on that field he'd ever experienced during a drought. And I went, that's, huh, I wonder what's going on there. And then in Knox County that same year, I took an infiltration rate, eight inches per hour. I took an infiltration rate in Odo County, 14 inches per hour on cover crops, soil health management, compost, cattle, corn and beans. And I went, dial this back. 2015, we only got 15 inches of rain in six hours. That's 14, eight inches per hour. That soil can handle it. That can handle the most extreme event I've ever witnessed all by itself. All the water goes in the ground. So really, are we seeing extreme weather? Or are we seeing an extreme response of the soil to the weather? 
And I am of the mindset that we've imperceptibly changed our soil through time, and we are not really intimately aware of what the real problem is. We can't get water to go in the soil, so why not? So that's what I'm here to talk to you today about, soil health, the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. I underlined the important part for me, the continued capacity of the soil to function. Most people say to me, is there really a definition of soil health? Can you really define that? Well, I just point right back at you and say, how do you define your health? You rolled out of bed this morning. You had the continued capacity to function. Your lungs work, your heart work, your, everything was working, right? Well, what if you had drank too much the night before? You might have a decreased capacity to function the next morning, feel like junk, have the flu. However, you still have a little bit of capacity to function. Same with soil. We can do a lot to it, but we're asking a lot of it too. Yeah, do you have a question? What time are you, uh, when did you do the soil thin or uh, test the soil absorption? Yeah, the question was when did I do those infiltration rate tests? Um, we do them year round. Um, there's different times of year when they'll, they'll show you different things. And so I'm, I'll get more into that, um, but good question. I think it's important to do it at the same time each year, agronomically. That way it's apples to apples. You can't compare a November infiltration rate to a June infiltration rate, not apples to apples. So all this soil health stuff is really affected by the time of year that we're out there looking at it. And if you want the peak of activity, go in June. If you want the bottom end, go in April or November. But whenever you do go, Make sure you go back the next year about the same time. So we can go out and, and the NRCS said we need, in Nebraska, we need a, a way to evaluate this. We need to, a way to go and experience this with farmers in a rational process. So in 2014, we, we worked on an area soil health team to develop a soil health assessment worksheet. And that's, that's where we kind of dove into some of those ideas and the NRCS is the, the rider of the soil survey. So we have this enormous capacity of soil scientists behind us. Their, their knowledge is vast and deep. And we just tapped into that and said, what are some properties of soil that we can look at in the field that, that management can change? And so when I asked that question, is, is the soil healthy? I go to a field and I ask that. Really, I'm just looking at those those factors that the soil scientists helped us understand and, and that on-the-job training that I got, you know, firsthand. Soil health is changed over time by natural processes, like those extreme weather events, the flooding. That's, gonna, that's landscape changing. You know, extreme weather can really change your soil health. But it's also manipulated through time with management. And that's something I learned is that the, the soil there's a whole bunch of properties that just change as we consistently apply a management technique. There's several aspects that we, we probably can't change very easily. And they're called, they're developed by the five soil forming factors. And I really like to, to dial it back to this level because it's important, it's foundational to understand that the soil that's on your farm was put there through these processes, the time, how long that soil's been there. A floodplain, that soil's really new. It's brand new. Sometimes the sediment's just rolled out on the field. That's brand new soil. It doesn't have very much structure. It doesn't have very much function. But it is full of organic matter and has a lot of nutrients in it. So how long the soil's been there really matters. The direction the soil faces. I learned that in New Mexico. If the soil's facing north, it's cool and wet. If the soil's facing south, it's hot and dry. And Aspect plays a, a big part into productivity in Nebraska, quite a bit less on, in this part of the state into moisture management and temperature because we can cover it with residue and kind of negate some of that. But it does, it does affect how the soil acts and functions. What it's made out of really matters. Is it a heavy exarbon clay, clay soil, silty clay loam? Is it a silt or is it a sand? You know, that, of course, matters. That plays a big part in how the soil functions. And then this last one, biology. 
Nobody ever talks about biology in soil. That's a, that's a bigger concept, biology. What lives there affects how the soil for, functions and, and how, what happened to that soil through time. That's where I'm going to key in today because I learned that soil function, the things we're asking the soil to do, so what do we ask the soil to do? We want water to soak in. We want water to come back to our plant. We want to put nutrients out there it, to hold those nutrients and it, to give it back to the plant. We want it to stay there. We'd really like our soil to stay put. But we'd also like it to hold up our crop, so stability. And we'd also like it to not have disease in it, to not have pollutants accumulate in it, and to, to be a buffer against other chemical processes. So buffering and filtering, that's another big function of soil. 90% of those things that we ask the soil to do, they're mediated by a microbe. The thing that lives in the dirt makes it soil. It's just dirt if nothing's living there. Soil has life, and life does things. The living things in the soil are what does all this work for us. Supporting the biological activities can improve the soil function. If we support them and then degrade them at the same time, we, we cannot improve soil function. But if we support them through time, we can gain some, some functionality. So I get asked, you know, I've been on this job for three years, what do you see? Well, a common problem in Nebraska, the common denominator in all crop fields in Nebraska that I've seen, is a tillage-induced root-restrictive compaction layer. What does that mean? I finally dialed in on a tillage website and they were selling a deep ripper. And they had this nice picture here that explained what the problem is. And they said they could solve it with a deep ripper. Well, there's a field cultivation plow pan, not grandpa's plow pan. That field cultivator left a plow pan right there at two to four inches. That's there, I find it all the time. There's a disc layer at six to eight inches. Yep, it's still there. Sometimes it's scalloped. It's got little waves in it from the disc blades. That's kind of neat to discover. Lay back some soil and see a little wave across the whole field. That's jaw dropping. And then I always am able to dig down to 12 to 16 inches and find a pretty thick plow layer. And until I went to a, the, a, a big tractor show in, in Northwest Iowa and saw some plowing in a field that had been plowed every year, continued plowed, that plow drops down in the soil and it hits a hard spot and it just rides. When it goes over a hill, it'll bite down in that plow pan and throw up a big clod. That's that plow pan, the base that that plow rides on. And we're all it's just, I mean, you can almost feel it pulling that tillage tool. Okay, it's sunk down and it's riding. And we think about tillage moving forward. But I'm of a mindset, how did this happen? Well, I did some calculations, and every disc blade on a double disc tandem disc, 250 PSI per blade. That's me standing on a one inch cube. Well, that's only 170 PSI. Oh, it's two of me. Standing on a one inch cube, I could shove that cube in the ground. That's a lot of pressure downwards. We always think about it moving forwards, but every piece of soil that that disc blade slides over is pushing down 250 PSI. And that makes a squash. It squashes it, just smears it, just like when we're digging a hole in clay. You can see that smear on the side of the hole. That's what happens laterally across the field in the flat line. And those layers, they're like a sheet of paper. They sit there and, th and they exist. Natural soil structure forms vertically. Air and water want to move in and out of the soil. Roots want to move in and out of the soil. Everything in the soil forms vertically. Frost freeze happens vertically. A piece of soil will freeze, it'll expand, and then it thaws. And so then there's a vertical crack. Free uh, wetting and drying happens vertically. All the soil movement is vertical or horizontal so that it forms a vertical crack. So that deep ripper, Yep, they said, we can get down past those layers and really stir them up. So I have, I've actually been on a field that's been deep ripped, and I found that compaction layer right there, kind of jumbled up up here. You can still see the hard clods, roots not going in them. 
can't access them. Then I found this layer right here. Yep, hard clods, all fractured. Roots can't go in those clods either. And then that plow pan, yep, I found, oh, I only found six inches of it. And then I found a wave and another plow pan at 16 to 18 inches where that deep ripper ran. Just a big wave in that, in that plow pan. Well, we can't solve a problem created by iron with more iron. That's, that's only pushing the problem deeper. And the deeper that plow pan is, the less biological activity there is. The deeper in the soil we go, the less biology there is. And so there's less ways to impact that long-standing problem than if it's at two to four inches. And so that light disking, you know, we can solve that with, with our cash crop roots, really. But not consistently, because those are only on 30-inch centers. So I dug this up in a cover crop trial we were doing in Thayer County. I found those cover crop roots blasted right through that plow pan. But every cash crop root turned laterally. And I went, well, they're all just roots. What's the deal? Well, of course, we've been kind of intuitively know that a tap root can go down. Well, that's called rooting pressure tolerance. And so I started to look at root restrictive bulk densities. So all that compaction, all that density of soil, the hardness, it's called bulk density. Bulk density is a measurement of how much soil you can fit in a cup. If you just drop it in the cup, you can fit half air, half, half soil. That's 1.33 grams per cubic centimeter. That's standard. Half air, half soil. If you worked so hard that you got 100% of the air out of that cup and shoved only soil in it, it'd be 2.66, double that. So that's solid soil, 2.66. And most topsoil, I discovered right here in this chart, this is a study that USDA did with ARS, most topsoil in crop fields is 1.43. And I thought, okay, that's noted. That first plow pan at seven inches that they found, they noted here, seven to eight, that disking layer, the top layer is 1.9, 1 1.87, 1 1.8, 1.78. And then down here, 1.6, 1.56 subsoil. Okay. Oh, what does that mean? I looked and looked and looked for a chart to discover what that meant to the root. And I finally found this chart you know, in a pretty old publication from USDA that talked about cash crop roots. And I, I, so I've included it here. And it's by soil texture. That's pretty convenient because every soil texture matters a lot to how density affects root movement. But when I look at ideal bulk densities, okay, 1.4 on a silt loam, silty clay loam, 1.4, okay, that should be fine, 1.43. Bulk densities that start to restrict or affect root growth, 1.6, 1.5, oh, that's subsoil. Yep, that's normal. Roots kind of slow down when they get at depth. But then I went bulk densities that restrict, stop root growth. 1.8, 1.8, 1.75, 1.65, 1.58, 1 1.47. Every soil texture is stopped, the root stopped at that top layer, 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter. And I, I went, oh, cash crop roots stop at dense soil. That makes sense. They work laterally until they find a crack and then they go down. We see those lateral root growths all the time. Well, that's a problem because that root is costing that plant a lot of energy to discover that new way down. It wants to access the soil profile, find nutrients, find water, form relationships. It just wants to go straight down as fast as it can. When it hits that root restrictive compaction layer, suddenly it's, it's languishing. It's got to do a lot of hard work to go laterally. And that top layer right there is stopping all that root growth. But when I looked at that picture right there, these cover crops, they're different. We're growing BMR corn that the roots can go through, but we're growing corn right next to it that can't. And I'm going, oh, these cash crops, are they hybridized? Have we lost some of that root pressure tolerance? 
I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm just asking the question because our cover crop roots, by and large, are able to penetrate this layer. We see some uh, lateral movement, but it'll only go a little ways, and then it just forces its way down through. And I'm going, this is starting to make some more sense. Bulk densities are restricting our root movement, but what else does a bulk density change restrict? That's where I, I started to dial in on. But before I go there, I'm going to talk about this. No-till systems. I was on a no-till system in Thayer County. The guy called me out. He goes, I'm about to till it. I've been no-till for 25 years. He goes, I hate to do it, but this is just, it's just not working. I can't get water. I, my nutrient cycling, I'm having to add more and more and more inputs. And I can't get my, my residue to go away. What's going on? And I went out there, and he had a one inch thick compaction layer at eight inches. It was as hard as concrete. And I went, that's a problem. 25 years of no-till and we still have a compaction layer at eight inches? Then I went, oh, we're not, we're not down there doing any work. Our cash crop roots, they're turning laterally and finding an old crack. They're not actually changing that layer. so it, Really, we're just sustaining soil structure. Oh, there's the word sustain. Finally, I got a place to put it. Sustaining soil structure, no-till, no-till management. Yep, and it's not solving all of our problems like we'd hoped it would. It's growing carbon, and with given enough time and root activity, we can do the work to, to really improve that soil with no-till, but it takes longer, and it works underneath the crop row but what about out in the row? What about the field wide? I'm still finding root restrictive compaction layers in long-term no-till fields all day, every day. Well, biological activity. We talked about the biology. So there's five things that, things that living things need, their habitat. Five things, food, water, air, three of them. We can recognize that. We all eat, drink, and breathe. But we also need space and shelter. Everything needs space and shelter. And underground, space is a pretty hot commodity. Space. You can imagine that underground, an earthworm, he's making his own space. He's an ecosystem engineer. He's digging and eating and creating his own space. Well, what if that space collapsed on him and killed him? Then he'd be dead. That, that wouldn't be too good. So they're really interested in their space not melting, not shifting, not blowing away, being structurally sound, just like our house. We don't want our house to blow away. So when I heard hold an earthworm, it's all gooey. That's its exudate. It's a, it's, it exudes liquid out of its body to soak into the soil around it. And it's just like Elmer's glue. When that exudate dries, it stabilizes. And that structurally in, it makes structural integrity of that channel. Roots do it, fungus does it, nematodes do it, bacteria does it, root, earthworms do it. Everything living underground does it the same exact thing. They all have an exudate. They all put a little bit of sugary water into the soil around it, and it dries and structuralizes. Biological activity regenerates soil structure because the root blows through that compaction layer and it puts an exudate in the soil around it. And the year after that trail's formed, another root just follows the same trail. That channel doesn't go away unless we till it, unless we destroy it. Cover crops, I talked about their rooting pressure tolerance. I can't iterate that enough. The work of a cover crop is not above ground, it's below ground. I could literally not care how much above ground biomass we have, except for a return on our investment if we're gonna graze it. I'm really concerned about whether those roots are penetrating that root restricted compaction layer. So I'll move into this. Um, building resilient soil is achieved by taking step one of this, this process right here, sorry I hit the wrong button, and 
we need to reduce tillage. Reducing tillage, we're good at that in Nebraska. I think later in my presentation, I'm going to talk about that. Nebraska is phenomenal at no-till. Almost everybody uses no-till some way, somehow at this point. And if they're not, they have a pretty good reason why they're not doing it, because it saves money and time. Those two things are clear advantages to no-till. Minimize disturbance. Well, we also have to maximize our soil cover. So this picture here shows all that crop corn residue left after harvest. That's a really familiar sight. One to 200% residue cover. We just cover that soil with a blanket of high carbon residue. But you know what? That dead piece of corn right there, it could care less what happens to it because it's dead. So I call that passive residue. It's pretty passive to what happens to it. So it'll impact, uh, intercept a raindrop and that raindrop will soak around it and drip down to the soil. And that's good, that's a good thing. But that living plant right there, that there's a little bit of green in this picture, it didn't come through very good. That green thing's putting its arms out like this saying, come here raindrop. It's actively interacting with the climate. It intercepts a raindrop and conveys that raindrop back to its stem and soaks it in by its root. That's active participation. So we can maximize soil cover by having some activity out there. We can get water to a stem and to a root and, and soak it in the ground and help that infiltration rate. But we can also protect the soil surface by intercepting that raindrop at the same time. So there's a little bit of a nuance on cover crops there that I'd like you to pick up. Maximizing biodiversity. We all don't want to eat bread and water every day, every meal for a month. And biology doesn't want to eat corn stalks and corn roots and corn root exudates and more corn stalks and more corn roots and more corn exudates every day, every year for however long we go corn on corn on corn. And by and large, they don't really like corn and soybeans, that oscillation of crops. They don't like that. Biology really responds when we put a true rotation on the ground and we're going to three crops or four crops. There's folks now in Nebraska growing nine crops. Well, that's, that's some niche markets. You get into six, seven, eight, nine crops, you're gonna have to grow some, some pretty uh, creative crops to get that done. That picture shows some buckwheat growing and you know, there's some folks trying that, trying to get into some niche markets. I would just challenge you to think about your oscillation and, and the food resource you're providing the biology. The last one I save is the most important. Provide a continuous living root. The only connection between that biology that's living underground and its food source, its energy, is a plant. The only way that that energy gets into the ground from the sun to the soil is through a plant. And if we don't have a plant growing there, the biology goes dormant. It goes dormant, it, it will sporulate, it'll go into hibernation, it stops eating, it stops consuming, and it shuts down for the winter. But if we have a living plant there, there's still a food resource, there's still respiration occurring, heat, water movement, air, and, and that biology will continue to live all through the winter. And we can move and shake and do that work underground year-round if we provide that continuous living root. And with that continuous living root, we have a real advantage to integrate livestock. And by putting livestock out there, it's like greasing the wheels on this thing. It really goes down the trail a lot faster. We can put manure and urine out there. For every cow pie, there's four to five pea spots in that field just by that one cow. So if you think you got a lot of manure, you got an awful lot of urine. They drink a lot of water. And that's a big deal, spreading that nutrient that's a kind of, an, it's been processed. It came from the soil to that plant, through that animal, and back to the soil. That biology really functions well, where you can inoculate that soil with that, that manure and really help the, the system change a lot faster. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Yep. So I can't talk about this enough, manage for habitat. How many times have you heard a farmer go out to his field and go, wow, look at my habitat? I never heard that. 
We can look at a tree row along a creek, and we can, some folks really like that, and they'll go, wow, look at my wildlife habitat. I can make that better. I can take out the cedar trees, Russian olive. I could plant a food plot along it. We could attract some wildlife there. We could build some structure and, and have some nesting habitat. We could improve our wildlife habitat. That's a real common idea. But why don't we use that to promote biological, biological activity in our soil? Managing for habitat allows organisms to form wet, stable aggregates. Remember that structural integrity that I talked about, those exudates? That's a stable aggregate, the little piece of soil right there that is stable. That exudate stays stable even when it's wet. That's the neat thing about the glue they use. It doesn't wash away very easy. So it stays stable when wet. And I'm gonna talk about why that's important just right here coming up. It increases infiltration rates, drainage, aeration, and it builds soil organic matter. Soil organic matter comes when we put carbohydrates in the soil from a plant or a, a root or an organism. That starts the cascade of activity in the soil that can result in soil organic matter increasing. So it's really important. So I'm gonna to shift to this slide. This is a new um, presentation that I've been doing this year. I had an opportunity to work with Paul Yaza and Stuart here. He's in the front row on Rogers Memorial Farm. They have been conducting a tillage study now for 40 years. This is the 40th year. Plowed in the fall, spring double disc, in randomized replicated plots right next to a complete no-till corn and bean system. No-till versus intense tillage. And there's a third and a fourth plot, I think. The third plot that I'm familiar with is 11 years of no-till and cover crops. So they're trying to see the rate of change with how cover crops can add to this. Today I'm gonna focus in on this tilled versus no-till. I was able to go out in the plot right on the edge and dig a hole. And I collected this soil for us today. I'm gonna step over here. We'll see if my head hits this screen. No, nope, if I stand right here, we'll be all right. So I collected these soil monoliths. I work with soil science scientists. I'm on the soils department. And I don't know if you've been to our federal building. There's a real opportunity there. Every state soil is represented in the federal building. There's a nice monolith just like this that it represents their state soil. It's a really pretty display. Big pieces of soil leaning against the wall all along their, their office walls. And I went, well, that's nice, but that's from the best pristine place that they could find that represented perfect soil. And I went, what about our working soil? Do you think this concept would work in a farm field? Oh, I don't know. I'd, we, it'd be a lot of work. And I, so I just went and did it. I took a shovel out there, dug a hole, and I chopped up this chunk of soil. And when I pulled it out, I thought, you know, that really is pretty neat. I think I can do that in the tilled soil. Oh, that was a whole different challenge. That tilled soil, it didn't want to stay together. It didn't, I had to really carefully lay this down and keep it in chunks. It was like a big puzzle. And then I took this back and on those soil monoliths, it's a 10 to two ratio, Elmer's glue to water. And you spray it on there and it soaks in the water and then you let it dry. And you do that about 10 or 20 or 30 times and finally, it holds together. And this is a, a freestanding soil monolith. You know, it, it stays right here. It's, it's been Elmer glued, school glue. I felt like I was in kindergarten. But what a neat opportunity to look at working soil for a change right here in front of you. Rogers Memorial Farm, 40 year tillage study. So straight away, this is the no-till pot. It's exarbon soil. It's on the same hilltop. They're, they're literally touching right next to each other. And I can immediately see a color difference. There's a difference in that soil that imperceptibly changed through time. And oddly, the whole field probably started off looking like this. So it's not that this one got worse. This one stayed the same and maybe got worse. This one has improved substantially, but 40 years of no-till. I can't iterate that enough. That's a pretty long investment period, but it can be done, and it was successful. And so 
I've identified some soil structure things here on the screen. If you can see those, I'm going to point them out to us today. To start off, a good soil scientist will tell you there's an A horizon and a B horizon in the soil. A horizon's topsoil and below there's subsoil. I dug these two larger square ones down to the same depth in the B horizon. After I started digging around in that soil, I realized my topsoil was thicker in the no-till soil than in the tilled soil. So I had to dig down deeper in this soil to get to the one inch of B horizon down here. So there's one inch of B horizon here and there's one inch of B horizon here. On this one, you can see it, it's that red clay. That's pretty common on, on hilltops around here. We, we can see that red clay exposed in some situations. So when I did that, I've added this book here because I dug this one too shallow. It's now paired with this one. This one's a lot taller than this one. And you can see that out on their plots. There's a, a dip into the tilled plot. It's pretty substantial um, to see that. Well, what caused that? This one right here, we fortunately have a lot of data from Paul Yaza and this slide that he gave me. This shows the tilled plot versus the plowed plot. The bulk density right here, three to six inches in the no-till was 1.11. Remember I said common crop fields were 1.43? Six to nine inches, it's 1.2 bulk density. And that plow pot, the top is three, three to six, is 1.39, and six to nine is 1.45. Well, that's not 1.9. That's not what I told you. Well, you know what? Tillage works. The funny thing about tillage is it decreases bulk density, increases infiltration, cycles nutrients, and warms the soil up. Just what we're asking it to do. But you know what? Down here at nine inches, that's where that plow pan sits, right below there. And I do believe it's at 1.9 grams per cubic centimeter. But the funny thing is, that this here is a little brick, and it is unassociated, even though it's not very dense, it's not 1.9 grams, it's 1.43 or 1.4, like I told you um, on the next slide. It's still unassociated with the soil below it. It still has that horizontal fracture, that plow pan that I talked about, and I couldn't get it to stay together very well, so I just left it apart. And because there's no residue on the soil surface, like this one, 2-1, two, 200% one, residue, the soil is exposed on this one. The top of it's all exposed. This is actually raindrop impact, soil crusting, and degradation from the sun. That's, there I broke off a chunk. That created this crust right here on the soil surface. And if I flip back a, a couple slides here, there's that crust right there. The crust that's formed from unstable aggregates. So when the raindrop hits that soil and the aggregate melts and shifts and blows away or moves with the water, it forms this crust. And this crust prevents water from infiltrating, just like that. Water then starts to move laterally instead of wick, like a wet paper towel. Wet paper towels don't move water very fast. And that's what this is all over the soil surface. And right below there, every crack that's horizontal in a, in a soil, it's called the matrix potential. And it's just like getting a wet paper towel to soak into a piece of cardboard. They're different materials, and so it's really, really difficult to get water to jump across material to material. It's called the matrix potential. It's a, it's a soil concept, and it's about how water sticks to itself, and then it sticks to other things. Water really likes itself more than it likes other things. So when it hits a crack like this, it does not like, want to move from one space to another, from one material to another. And so when I come down here on the back, I can see the disc blades. There's a ribbon right here, a curve in the, in the till pan, that crack that formed horizontally. That's that double disking in the spring. And when I look down here at the bottom, right at that subsoil, that heavy clay, that's where that plow rides every fall, right there at the bottom. 
there's a nice plow pan in this soil, heavy plow pan. But you tell me that the, the bulk density wasn't too bad, still under 1.43, like I said. Well, for one season, for one time, that soil is fluffier than, than it could be. But ever try to convert to no-till cold turkey? That first season into no-till is the worst. It's hard as a brick. That soil settles and it gets really, really dense. And that's the, the worst. We'll come off of that tillage fluff and settle into the highest bulk density that we'll have and then we'll start to improve. And that one to three, they call it five years of faith in a no-till conversion, well, that's the bulk density challenge. That's a settling of that soil down to its, its natural density. So when I point out this concept here, this is in the row. This is a controlled traffic system. So the plants are planted in this row every year, corn and beans, corn and beans, within an inch or two. So there's corn and bean residue right here. So every year, corn roots are growing right here. And when I look down, you know, I see corn roots coming straight down, clear through the soil profile. Well, right next to it, and I've actually got it on the wrong side. I'll just shift this over for discussion's sake now. Right here is next to this corn plant, but right over here, out in the middle of this row, is platy soil, a horizontal platy soil right here. And this is a non-tire track row. It's not seen a tire track in 40 years. So this no-till has retained a little bit of poor soil structure. You know, he's measuring those water infiltration rates and the till or the no-till wheel track is 0.6, but that soft middle row, four inches per hour soaking into that ground right here. In the plowed plot, the wheel track is 0.2 and the soft middle, that's right here, the soft middle, 0.4 inches per hour. That's pretty phenomenal that it can be that low. And it's about the same as the, the no-till tire track. No-till tire track is just a little bit higher than the tilled tire track and tilled soft row. The neat thing about Paul Yaz's data is that it comes with yield data. And that's the phenomenal story. We can all kind of apples to apples compare yields. I like to look at the bulk densities because that tells a story. And that's the story that our NRCS data is showing us on some other projects. But this yield data is pretty phenomenal. 08 to 11, the corn and beans and the plow down here in 15, you know, the, the corn was 223 and the 186 in the plow pot. And in 2018, the beans did right with each other. So beans are able to survive in this condition with the, the plow pans, but the corn really is starting to separate year after year, creating a pretty big divide in that system. So when I flip back to here, pretty sure I've kind of pointed out all the things that I thought I should. Later, if you want to look at this, that's, that's fine. The neat opportunity that I brought you today that's a little different because I had enough time. I brought some original soil from those two plots. These are, they don't have Elmer's glue on them. And this is stable soil. So this is called an aggregate. And this aggregate is, is stable when dry. I can hold it, it's not falling apart. This is from the no-till pot, and this is from the till pot. You can see the colors match. But I think that I'd like to show you that wet stable aggregate concept. What happens when the soil gets wet? And if you've seen this before, it's, it's a good opportunity to see it again. If you haven't seen it, this is pretty phenomenal. This is what happens when that crust gets wet and when the topsoil right here gets wet. So when water goes into soil, air has to come out. That's the only water, way water can get in, is air to come out. So I want you to look for those air bubbles when I put it in this water but I also want you to just consider what happens during that rainstorm. There's some air bubbles coming out of this soil. Oh, there's some air bubbles coming out of that soil too. But pretty soon, there's no more soil left. 
So as those aggregates get wet, and we're on a hill slope, and water's not soaking in, and water starts to move horizontally, this stuff is in the water, and it's moving. And that's water erosion. And when we don't have wet, stable aggregates like this, we have soil erosion. So do we really have an erosion problem or an erosion symptom? Do we really have a wet, stable aggregate problem or do we have a biological problem? So we need to put some biology and some time into the soil so that the biology can fix the soil health. That's the workers. That's the tool. That's the way that we're managing for soil health is to let the biology do the work for us. We can work on plant health and improve how it helps the soil. That's the key, good farming practices. We've got to manage for plant health so that it can do more work underground. There's no more soil left here. It's just gone. It's down the hill, it's ran off, it's in the creek, it's in the next river, and now it's in the Platte, and now it's headed to the Missouri and the Gulf of Mexico. That's a problem. That's the problem we have all across Nebraska. A half an inch per hour infiltration rate is average on all crop fields that have ever seen tillage. And no-till fields were at two inches per hour, four inches per hour if it's controlled traffic. But that's not quite enough. That's not quite enough to solve this problem and to go to here, and to go to here, and to, to actually sink water in the ground. So there's a big, a big difference when we sink water in our soil profile and store that water for our crop. So Aaron, I have a quick question. Yep. So is the, the thickness difference between the tilled and no-till soil, is it due to compacting that airspace or is it just due to pure soil loss? There is definitely some soil erosion and there's some compression. Both are occurring at the same time. So there's not eight inches of topsoil there, but there's a little bit more density and there's a little bit that's lost to, the, to, to erosion for sure. It's both problems that's causing that height difference. So in our CS Nebraska, like I said, we, we got together and we thought, how can we work with farmers and learn with them? You really can't understand something that you don't measure. You can't monitor something that you don't measure. So we needed to get some benchmark data. So we worked together with our soil scientists and talked about dynamic soil properties, properties in the soil that change. I can't change how long that soil's been there, but I can change how long a plant is there. I can manage those biology characteristics of the soil and change some dynamic properties in the soil, like we talked about. Biological activity, bulk density, the, the color can change, aggregate stability can change, and soil structure. Those are all very observable in the soil. We can dig a hole, we can capture a snapshot, we created a ranking criteria for every one of those properties, and we can score it, and we can say, you know what, your soil structure is your problem here. You've got some biology, you've got earthworms. Your soil color's not that bad compared to how bad it could be, but I think if you improved your soil structure, we could get off the center and start improving the whole soil health. So we can go and, and find the limiting factor the fact, you know, that plow pan created that, that radish root to branch into four pieces, four, four roots. I, think I call that four for the price of one because all those tap roots then went down through that plow pan. And by managing for soil health, we changed the dynamic from a bacterial dominant soil to a balanced soil with bacteria and fungus in it. Most of our crop fields don't have a lot of fungus so that biological activity and diversity really matters. There's a stable channel from an earthworm. It was, we thought it was funny that you could see through it. Well, those earthworm channels stick around for a long time and they allow water movement. This doesn't show up very well, but it's just chock full of earthworm holes. And that allowed that water to just soak in as fast as we could pour it on there. So what's our current problem? 143 days without addressing the real problem. We have a fallow period in our crop fields. 
and we really need to put some green life out there. This, where are we focusing our effort, attention, and dollars? To sustain our current situation or regenerate our soil function and our soil health. We need to exercise the soil. We need to be disciplined enough to keep those principles in place. And we need to get off of this, this problem. So I've got a series of pictures here that show a, a process on a demonstration farm that we went through by adding cover crops. We added biology and we changed the, the soil life and the infiltration rate on that field. When I say demonstration farms, NRCS Nebraska created the Soil Health Initiative for NRCS. We said we want a soil health initiative, so we created it. And we focused on partnerships, geographically distributing key resources, like observational demonstration plots like this. Um, this picture is of Darrell Obermeyer's farm. He's in the back here, down by Auburn. It's a frost-killed cover crop versus a winter-hardy cover crop. And then down there in the banana belt, there's enough time after harvest to grow a fair amount of residue and then let it frost kill. When we go out to Shadron, boy, they frost killed in September. There's no time for a frost kill cover crop. You know, that's a different climate. That climate really plays a part into this opportunity. And we're watching yields and economic return on those two strips through time and really coming to some, some good conclusions. We're funding and monitoring these demonstration farms. We're providing that local source of information and we're validating soil health management right there in that, in that community. So people can see it. They can read the case study and, and see it. We've got 17 demonstration farms across the state. They're five year field projects. They're field wide, so they're agronomic. They make sense to farmers. What's happening there is real. It's, it's actual decisions that are happening in real time. But we're also monitoring this with some really big tools from Nebraska On-Farm Research Network and our partner who's going to talk next, UNL Agronomy Department, Agronomy and Horticulture. They've been great partners. But we've been able to implement these randomized replicated plots and do soil health assessment, lab analysis, and economic evaluations. And that's been a really big deal. We're trying to tell the story, to walk, to walk through that story with that farmer and actually capture it capture what happens. So here's a map of all those farms. And you can see they're, they're spread out. And there should be one near you. There's one in Seward County, Odo County. There's the one by Auburn. And there's some up here north in Colfax County and Dodge County. So keep an ear out for those field days. We have field days all the time. The one in Odo County is um, Mike McDonald's farm south of Douglas. He's got a, a plot there laid out. And he's on the NRD board down there and is a really good partner. No till on the Plains board of directors too. So some of our uh, comparisons are here. Cover crop versus no cover crop is a, a one that we facilitated a lot of them. And these locations. Um, we also started a ranch initiative in 2018, so we're also testing some rangeland management now and how it improve infiltration rates, bulk density, and some of the same concepts on rangeland are really important. And rangeland health is actually a concept that started many, many, many years ago in New Mexico where I worked, down there at uh, NMSU. They started a, on the Horonado. Uh, research center. They started rangeland health monitoring. Um, I wanted to touch on this. I'm going to hurry through this because I know I'm running out of time. Um, but the ag census is a really neat measurement of success for Nebraska. It's something I thought I would portray to you today. Uh, there was a good statistical response brought back, 74.5%. Uh, That's knock your socks off good response. Thank you all for responding. If you did respond to that, it matters. This is the longest running agronomic survey there is since 1840. And it tells a county by county by county story about agriculture and what we're doing out here. So it's a really phenomenal survey. I've looked up some quick statistics here. Percent of harvested acres in Nebraska with tillage practices. In 2012, we had 49.8% of harvested acres get reported as no-till. 
And in 2017, we tipped the pen, the, we got over the hump. We're 52.7%. That's a really big deal. And I hope through discussion with Fernando, we can portray how big of a deal long-term no-till systems impact the, the success of cover crops. We have so many acres now, out of the 22 million acres in Nebraska, half of it is no-tilled. 11 million acres that, that can respond to a cover crop really, really well. So we're gonna get into, I, I pulled out the definitions of no-till, tillage operations, because I think that's important. That's in your handout there, just so you understand what some of these definitions are of these terms, because how they define them might be how, different than how you define them. When I looked at reduced tillage and no-till, that was the first thing that fell out. Nebraska had 83.3% of the harvested cropland acres that fell in reduced till or no till. So we tweaked that apart and figured out what the no till percentage was. And on this one, this is just flat no till. Number one in the nation for no till acres in 2017. And we went just in 2012, we were number one in the nation as well. And when we look down, we see some, some of our neighbors right here doing well too in the top 10. No-till is something that's widely accepted and, and adopted. And it's good to see us keep continuing to increase that acreage every year and see that rate of change. So I'm gonna go to this one. Um, this is the total number of cropland acres with cover crops and the change from 2012 to 2017. And we were fifth in the nation for the percent cover crop acres of total in, in cover crops. So that's pretty exciting because we're, we're keeping pace with the leaders, with the other states that, that have the same agronomics as us, the same climate, same opportunities. Missouri, Indiana, Iowa, you know, we look at Iowa a lot as the same as Eastern Nebraska. And we're, we're keeping pace, but doggone it, we're only 3.8% with cover crops, and cover crops work. I can't tell that story enough. We have a lot of opportunity. 50% of our acres could respond to cover crops really quickly. And we could get off a zero and, and head towards a, a really good factor and it change our infiltration rates and stop flooding down the river. That could have a big impact on Nebraska. We could store some water, grow some crops, and do some good. Then I had a question, I gave this presentation to the Healthy Soil Task Force, governor's uh, appointed legislative task force there um, by Senator Gregert uh, from Knox County. And I got asked the question, well, who's doing this? What size farm is doing this? Well, the neat thing about the ag, ag statistics data is we can pull that out. And we can look at the number of farmers, the total number of farmers here that are doing that in these categories of total size of their farm. So the most farmers that we have doing cover crops are small farmers. But this one to 499 acres is, is pretty large too. So that's affecting quite a few more acres. And then this 500 to 999 acres, 238 reported farmers using cover crops in 2017. 150% rate of change. That was a big movement right there in that sector. And then down, the, down here, we can see those. Total number of farms using cover crops actually went down, 49,000 to 46,000 but we went up in total acres because of that group right there. And this group, that rate of change really took us up in acres compared to 2012, but down in the total number of users. So I pulled out the acres just so we could see those. 2012 acres and 2017 acres. This is 17s, this is 12s. Um, and number of farms, I stuck that in there in the middle column there. So you can see this 
rate of gain right here went from 60,000 to 150,000 acres. That was a big rate of change. So when we start working with larger and larger farmers, more and more acres come along with it. And that, that really helps uh, cover more territory. So then I compared that to the total number of acres that were harvested, total harvested acres in 17 across the board. Where's the acres fall that we have? Who's farming these acres? Seven million are farmed by two farmers that have 2,000 or more acres. So there's half the pie right there out of the 19 million that were reported. Not all of our, our acres got harvested in 17, supposedly. But this group right here represents about half the pie too. And so that's, that's not a bad thing. We can focus on everybody with this and, and try and get us uh, moving in the right direction. I can't thank Nebraska On Farm Research Network enough. Um, this is a real opportunity to portray our data. It's peer-reviewed data that goes into this report annually. The annual results update is a peer-reviewed journal that, or publication that happens. And that peer review really takes the weeds out of the, of the good information. And it's statistically evaluated, and it's, it's really solid evidence of whatever's portrayed there, good and bad evidence. So you can trust it. That's what I'm trying to portray. And that results update, then they go around the state and, and, and tell the results of all their on-farm trials that occurred that year. And you still have a chance to attend these. These are scheduled in February. I'd really ch ask you to get to the results update. You'll learn about everything agronomic at that meeting. Every study that's done, I mean, you name it and they're studying it with farmers on their farm, just like we are with cover crops. And because there were so many cover crop studies this year, I propose that we host a soil health focused meeting in York. And so for the first time, host co-hosting with UNL's On-Farm Research Network or Nebraska On-Farm Research Network, we're gonna have that co-hosted meeting to not only portray our case studies, but the other case studies that they're working with farmers on for cover crops and soil health management. So it's a pretty exciting opportunity. And we're partnering then with UNL's agronomy department to bring in some keynote speakers and have some subject matter experts that can portray their research on farm and what they're experiencing too. Um, the last folks that I'd really like to recognize are ag extension agents. Our, our Nebraska extension program here is phenomenal. We have great partners in extension agents. They're really, really important to the success of all of this. You know, Tyler, he knows how to host a meeting. He's got food back here and coffee, and that, that makes a big difference. And they, you know, Gary Leswing down there at Auburn, he's out there writing down data as they weigh the, the corn in the way wagon. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. And without those partnerships and people on the ground, this story couldn't happen. And so you, Nebraska's extension, they host CropWatch here. CropWatch is, is a really great center for communication about everything related to our agriculture in Nebraska. And this year, we got them to host a Soil Health Initiative webpage to portray all the case studies, all the projects that are related to soil health so that you have a one place to go and look at Nebraska, the university's information on, on soil health. I think it's a big opportunity to go uh, down here in the Soil Health Initiative column. There's the case studies that you, just off the screen there, sorry. Um, all the case studies from the Nebraska funded projects are right there, uh, the NRCS funded projects, sorry. So go to that website, CropWatch uh, Soil Health, and check that out and look for that other information on um, Nebraska's on-farm research network as well. Then I'd ask you, how can you improve Nebraska's soil health? Dig a hole, see what your soil looks like, and see if you have those restrictive layers, and see if you can fix that problem. We're an equal opportunity provider and employer, and there's my contact information. Um, I segue into another presentation here. So, are there any questions? Yes, sir.
Yeah. Semis loading out or auger wagons driving the same track. Uh, St. Louis really, I think, would be for anhydrous. And you're saying for anhydrous, that is not part of the till. It's still so, Anhydrous is an, an odd form of nitrogen. Um, it's cheap and it's, it can be applied. You know, there's some biology considerations there. I don't know the answers to all of those questions, um, but in and of itself, anhydrous is pretty disruptive to the soil structure. And when you apply it really dictates whether that's, be, you know, whether you're getting good efficiency out of that nitrogen resource. Um, so that all matters, but. As far as the, the soil, all we're doing yeah. is pushing the problem down, is it better to leave it alone? So the question is, is that compaction that we from wet soils harvesting and all the tire traffic that went across these fields, is it causing compaction? Yes. And should we deep rip that? So if we don't have soil health today, that system is really dependent upon us to, to, to manage it. And how we manage that is up to you and your situation. If you do tillage, I would really challenge you to put some cover crops on it. Settle that soil back down, put some roots in there to stabilize the new bulk density and the new infiltration rate that's achieved there. And we can retain some of that before it settles right back down. So cover that up with some, some cover crops, fix the problem. I had another guy that had like four inch ruts. I said, could you just fill those with compost? Well, maybe then that'd be a really nice strip through your field. It'd be a source of nutrients and topsoil. So there are other alternatives to tillage, but the feasibility of a lot of compost across a lot of acres, sometimes tillage is an answer. But what we found is in the same time, when that field was already healthy, five years of cover crops, we didn't make ruts. We're harvesting when the soil's still wet, and the soil has the capacity, the strength, to hold that combine up even when it's wet. That's that structural integrity. This soil right here that's still in that water column, it's stable when wet. Stability is what holds up your combine. It's what holds up your implement. So farming is a disturbance. We know that we're disturbing that ground. Tire tracks leave compaction. But if we can lessen that, if we can use some alternatives to, to tillage, if we can plant cover crops and, and support that weight distributed across the soil surface a little bit, armor the soil, there's a lot of concepts that go into that. But I think if you're in a current agronomic corn bean oscillation and you left tracks out there, tillage is a, a pretty good tool to fix that, but plant a cover crop, stabilize it for sure. Yep. So the question is, is controlled traffic. Is it important with combines and grain carts and hauling the grain out of the field? And then, you know, reiterating that, yes, the studies show that most of the damage from compaction occurs on the first pass. 70 to 90% of the compaction that can occur in a soil occurs when you drive over it the first time. So the second time you drive on it, you're not doing as much damage as the first time. The third time, you're not doing nearly as much damage as the second and first time. And so while that looks bad all winter and feels bad all year, that's not 70% damage across your whole field. And I'm having worked with farmers on this, it's not an easy thing to achieve less than 50% of your rows with the tire track. But Paul Yaza has it, it nailed in over here. And when I saw the difference between the non-tire track row and the tire track row, that 0.6 inches per hour versus four inches per hour, less than 50% of his field has a 0.6 inch per hour infiltration rate. More than 50% has four inches per hour. We can't, I, I just told Nebraska farmer this, you can't harvest your crops with an airplane. We've got to drive on the soil. 
Right now, that's the only way to get her done. But if we can decrease the number of rows that are impacted, we can maintain those higher infiltration rates and really create that opportunity for water to move across the field and soak in somewhere. So yeah, controlled traffic, and it goes all the way down to the grain cart, and that sometimes those are part-time help, you know, harvest workers, and sometimes they just want to cut across the field and make the shortest exit. It's a, it's a tough concept. But the infiltration rate and bulk densities really show that, that it matters where we drive. So. Yeah, or five pathways, or I do think that eventually you're doing more damage than it's worth if you create a road, then it should just be a road. You know, it might not agronomically make sense to be farming that road if that's where you're going to drive your semis and all your equipment a thousand times. But if we're talking one, two, three passes, yep, put all three in the same trail. If you have a heavy use area, then make it a heavy use area. Stop putting all the inputs into it. When I say, when I guess when I ask that question, I'm saying with the sailor green card, as you go up the field, the way you're going, you do your pass there where you make you know, two or three passes at the start, and then you go up the ways and do that again. But over along the end rows, sometimes you don't have a choice. You have to. Yep. So you and those end rows, that's part of farming, and that's going to see heavy, that's kind of a heavy use area, but it's not quite a road. <laughs> And so there's folks that are using cover crops immediately after that to, to put roots down through that. And so when I look at cover crop incentive programs, I'm going to move into the next presentation, if that's all right, Tyler. Sure, yeah, that, uh, yeah that's fine. Um, and we'll have time maybe for some questions when, uh, when we get done with this. But I also want to say that John Albert from uh, Lower Platte South NRD is here to kind of help. Okay. Some of these things are related to... Yeah, let me cover the NRCS stuff. And, yep. and so he can, yeah, kind of jump in wherever and sure. you guys can just tag Thanks, John. So like I said, Corey couldn't be here. And, you can. and John didn't know he was going to do this until about 45 minutes ago. And he called and said, uh, I'm in Valparaiso. I can be there by 10.15. It's like, all right, here you go. So, so you guys just kind of do, a, sure. do what you do and um, kind of let you do your thing. So, so I'm going to talk about some of the NRCS stuff after the NRD information, um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of the optimal way to get into cover crops and how cost share can help that. Um, but there are, there's money right here in Lancaster County to help you do this, and we're going to try and portray that. Right off the bat, John, is the NRD information. The purpose of their cost share and the cover crops are intended for a goal. You have to have a reason to plant cover crops, and that's what we're really going to work with you to do, is pick out what is the reason. What's the real problem that we're trying to address with that cover crop? And the reason why Paul Yaza and others really get on this is because if we don't have a reason, we get to the end of the game and we go, were we successful? Well, no, it didn't, it didn't hold down all my residue and my nitrate tests are still high. What, no, what was the reason we did this? We are trying to, what, solve compaction or prevent erosion. And when we, get, when we get to the end of the game, we say, did we achieve that? Yes, we did prevent erosion. We did work to address compaction. But at the same time, you know, that cover crop could have done this, it could have done this, and it could have done that. It's a lot different mental image when we have success and then compare it to some things we'd hoped for versus when we have no measurement of success we get to the end and only see negatives. So it's really, really important that we capture what the measurement of success will be. And that's, that's where a conservation planner can really help you and dig a hole, see what the, the problem is, and, and then create a good objective. So John, your program is here in Lancaster County and uh, in, the, in the district. I'm just gonna load this all. It's, it's important to note that we've expanded that. The first year we had this program, unfortunately, we were turning a lot of people away because it was more narrowly targeted, you know, just a few watersheds, and everybody was just missing the boundaries. So it's been vastly expanded. You know, we're targeting uh, lake uh, watersheds, wellhead protection areas, things like that. So the expansion of the program is a good thing. We want to encourage participation. And I'd like to preface everything else I'm going to say by 
saying that these brochures certainly are available on the NRD website, but it is best when you apply for cover crops that you go to your local NRCS office, you know, Weeping Water, South End of Town and Lincoln, uh, Wahoo, uh, uh, Seward, and make this as a plan with your local NRCS staff because the, essentially they're going to ask you what you want to plant, where you want to plant it, how you want to plant it, and there's guidelines that we have to go by. So it's very much a planning process. And what the NRD does is certify it according to NRCS standards. And you know, there's seating sheets that need to be filled out. There's dates that uh, have to be applied by. So in concert with your NRCS office, if you're contemplating that, you know, come in well ahead of time so we can get you approved and planned. And under these terms, the screen is very helpful, um, we have three different mixtures, and the payment rate varies depending upon what you plant with a cap of $2,000 an acre for each individual producer. The timing varies, uh, aerial broadcast prior to October 1st, drilling prior to November 1st. Now, that can be a problem, depending upon how late harvest is, you wanna get the cover crop in, but what we're trying to do is actually get something that emerges and it has a chance of succeeding before we get into winter, and I realize, you know, cover crops can be problematic in that regard, but we're kinda of targeting this towards success. And um, after that cover crop is planted, NRCS certifies it. Uh, you return the seed tags, the, uh, the bills for the seed to NRCS, and then the NRCS certifies the completion of the project in the spring and then gets you paid. So, and again, the, the haying and grazing is not part of this cover crop, particular cover crop program. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, Any last comments? Uh, not about that unless someone has a particular question. Uh, why uh, not allowing grazing? Um, it was consonant with what we think a cover crop should be doing, and of course it's conservation-based, and we feel that it's probably more conservation-based if we limit the grazing of that cover crop. Yeah, so the question was why not allow grazing? And you know, we deal with that too in our programs and it adds another la layer of complexity when grazing's allowed. Mm -hmm. we and have we have the capacity to form a grazing plan with that person and really if, if we go an ounce into overgrazing, then we've robbed Peter to pay Paul. And it's, it's really detrimental to the soil surface to overgraze it, so. And, and you know, they wanted to minimize input. Yes. They have those animals out there and, and leave everything that they do. The urine as, urine as well would seem to be a benefit. So, yeah, so this the reason a lot of us have been reluctant to, to do that because we can't utilize that crop later on. So the statement is that I portrayed a really big benefit to livestock, and that all, all is true. But like I said, if we're doing this for an erosion control perspective, then having the residue and the limited residue that's there plus the cover crop really is the, the number one best way to reach that objective and, and control the erosion. That's just the way we're headed now. That's not to say it couldn't change, but that's where we're at right now. And so it just gets into management considerations at, at that point and then we can you know, work into that. So there are other opportunities for cover crops and through EQIP is a really uh, good opportunity. 2020 is the first application period where we can accept return customers. So for the first time, Nebraska NRCS is allowing, if you've grown a cover crop with us before, and you have a new acre that hasn't seen a cover crop, you can come in and apply for that cost share. There's also gonna be some mandates that come with it. You're gonna have to grow that cover crop for three years there on that same acre, and it's gonna need to be a mixed species. And so we're gonna need to, to really be serious about that application of cover crop and really put the, the, a good plan together to address the resource concern, the compaction layer in three years, so that that cost share does make a difference. If we apply cover crops once and we abuse it or it's not successful, have we really treated the resource concern? We had a great learning opportunity, but the soil still might have some problems in it. So that's where that return customer opportunity is afforded to you. 
um, eligibility, everybody is eligible with us. Uh, we do need to have cropland that's reported to FSA. Yes, sir? Is that a three-year continuous or a three-year in your rotation? Three years in your rotation on that acre. So for three years, that acre is going to see a cover crop each year. Even corn, beans, whatever's grown there, we're going to plant it after harvest. Hasn't there been a lot of research done as far as cover crops removing nutrients prior to corn? Yeah. There is, but we're also... Why would you want to put a cover crop in right before your corn crop? Wouldn't you want to do that prior to your soybean crop in that rotation? Yep, so the question is, is, is there research that shows that cover crops ahead of corn being a detriment and tying up some nutrients? There is. Um, it all comes down to management considerations and how you manage the cover crop and the species in that, in that mix and when we terminate them. So all of the studies that pointed to that nutrient tie-up were completely aged out cereal rye. So it went to seed and it was 80 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So a lot of carbon out there right ahead of that corn crop. And we're overcoming that with 40 to 60 pounds of starter in. But that's a, the toughest, exactly the toughest circumstance to start growing cover crops in, to plant corn into it. It's the most challenging agronomically because we need good emergence, we need good nutrient availability, and all those good farming practices that, that you're talking about. But no, it's not the cover crop's fault. It's that we didn't terminate it in a timely enough fashion and we allowed it to get real, real woody out there. So if we're terminating that cover crop at 8 to 12 inches, like we're recommending, it's really actually high in protein, and that lays down on the ground and becomes almost immediately available to that soil's ecosystem. And it can be a flush of nutrients later in the season, right after that starter fertilizer is used up. So you're getting pretty high up there in the cost per acre basis than when you're talking $3 corn, aren't you? That's where we're alleviating the cost of the seed and application. So it's $33 an acre, I'm gonna get into that next. Um, that pays for the, the cost of the application and, and your tractor use. So we're going to plan a $20 to $25 mix, and you've still got $12 to $10 to $12 there to run the tractor. So it's, we're alleviating the risk of, of the actual implementation, but the, the net results agronomically are the risks that you're going to take to invest in your soil. And so... Hopefully, you know, we make some good management decisions. We terminate at the right times. And that's what I was really going to get into, I think, right here. Planting deadlines, the dates that we were going to propose. The very, very best time to plant your first cover crop is right after corn harvest. That's the easiest time to get out there. It's, yep, it's late. Plant cereal rye. Plant cereal rye, camelina, and, and wheat. Three species, we've got a mix, meets our criteria and it's after corn. Those species can be planted today and still be successful. Frozen ground, there's guys planting all across Nebraska on frozen ground. Scratching it in, putting seed out there, and by and large, the residue moves, covers it up, and we get germination in the spring. Is that the latest and greatest opportunity for that cover crop? No. But it is a chance. It is work being done in the ecosystem, and it is plant energy going into the soil. So is it the best window of opportunity? No, but it is agronomically because when we get to spring, we have a really good chance to let that cover crop grow all the way to maturity. Knock it down, spray it out, whatever we need to do, plant soybeans. Soybeans are very forgiving. If one seed doesn't germinate, the two next door compensate and overcome for the yield. Agronomically, soybeans can be planted later, earlier, when, they're at, when the ground's right, and they can tolerate some green tissue around them until we can terminate that cover crop. So for the first time under the 2018 Farm Bill, cover crops are a good farming practice. So now in this area, we can plant green. We can plant soybeans green and still be insured. And so work with your crop insurance provider to understand that before you go and dip your toe into that but just understand that cover crops can be managed a little bit better now under the farm bill. And I think it's a really good opportunity after corn into soybeans because after soybean harvest is when we need the residue the most. And really, after corn, we're growing high carbon residue that gets knocked down 
underneath that soybean residue or canopy. And after harvest, we'll still have cover crop on the ground surface, protecting that soil from erosion and going through that year. And so if we can plant something after soybean harvest, like brassicas, um, there's clovers and all sorts of things that are higher in nitrogen, or even cereal grains like oats that frost kill at a really young age, that can lend itself to, towards that corn crop the next year really, really successfully, actually. Um, so a lot of our studies are showing there's no hit to the corn yield after cover crops. And that, so we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Um, the terms, you can look at those. We need to, to have a reason. We need to work with you on a species list and design that cover crop. We're going to work together to figure out what your objectives are and which species really meet that goal for the time that we're going to plant, the way that we're going to plant, and the soil and, and, and what crop is behind and up in the future so that we can design that cover crop well. Um, grazing is allowed, providing the primary purpose of the cover crop is being met. Like I said, if we can manage that grazing well and not degrade the resource, create trailing, bare ground. I mean, we've all seen it. Folks look at that and go, wow, that is green and I want to graze it. And they take it all. They lick it up. And by and large, that bare ground, that's what we're trying not to have. So by, we're not going to put money, public money, onto a circumstance that results in a degraded resource. But that it's not saying we have to do that. And so a prescribed grazing plan can calculate how much corn residue there is to graze, how much cover crop residue we're adding to that, and a proper stocking rate to take it and, and manage it well, and then monitor it. That's the key. It's just good farming practices. Um, NRCS certification will occur after the crop is seeded, after it's established, or after it's terminated, depending on that reason why we're growing it. So if we're doing this for compaction, it's immediately, when you seed that cover crop, the seed's there, you've made the effort, and then we'll pay you. And so that's a kind of a new thought process behind that. Um, CSP is another really good opportunity to work with, you, with folks um, from the NRCS. And I, I would just portray that it's a whole farm plan, and we're, we're paying for good farming practices to continue, and we're gonna take a lot of what you're already doing and take it to the next level and incentivize or, or pay a, a, a um, performance um, payment for what you're trying to achieve. So cover crops, the cost share in cover crops in CSP is like eight to $10. It's the idea of taking it from a monoculture to a mix. And we're gonna cover the difference between what you're already doing and what, you, what, you know, what we're recommending. So um, that being said, eligibility, producers the same as uh, Equip, they have to have an effective control of the land for the term of the contract. Cover crops can be grown for all those reasons, and the reason's yours to pick. We're going to work with you, come out and do a soil health assessment, really address, identify the resource concerns that you have. And for either the NRD program or the NRCS programs, we're going to walk through this with you. And that's the, what we just really would like to portray is that we're we're learning, but we've seen a, a couple of cover crop fields in the past, and so we can help you make some good decisions. Um, the neat thing is we're still taking applications. Because of the delay in the farm bill, we're still taking EQIP and CSP applications, and so come and check, them, check with your local office and get in the door and ask them about opportunities that you have. Um, more information from your local field office. So any questions on any of that? After beans. beans every year, but <coughs> so there's, the question was, is cover crops only after soybeans? Does that do any good, and, and is there any evidence of that? Um, that's actually a study we're doing in Dodge County. He had that exact situation. It has his, his benchmark, cover crops after soybeans only in one strip versus cover crops after corn, beans, and wheat. And so we added a, a crop, and we added cover crops every year. 
and the infiltration rate and bulk density are separating after three years. We're making rate, rates of change in the, in the continuous cover crop field that we're not making in the cover crop only after soybean field. And so, yes, that's doing something, but is it, a, is it doing it at a rate of change that we're gonna perceive and actually make it our, you know, our goal? I, I'm not sure that we are. That would take a long time. It's just little incremental moves Whereas we can make three years of investment and get clear to here and then go stay the same, then that would be better in my mind. So it's kind of an initial investment with cost share and then we can get to a, a higher level of function and, and health and then we can make some incremental, you know, really tight management decisions like cover crops only after soybeans or only after corn. So that's it. Tyler, I think it's... Yep. John, do you have anything else to add? No, I do not. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here, which probably means I've been around too long. But um, I just wanted to talk, you know, briefly. The NRD, of course, has a number of other programs available. And most of you know this. Some of you may not. And for most of the NRD programs, the contact point... Use the mic. Yeah. Use the mic. Yeah. Uh, the contact point, again, is the NRCS office. Um, these brochures, yes, they're available at the NRD, but if you send them into the NRD, we need a little bit more information. So if you start at your local NRCS office, we have a number of programs that you can take advantage of. The uh, conservation uh, practices were terraces, tile outlets, buffer strips, uh, both the Nebraska buffer strip program and the NRD's own buffer strip program. And uh, forestry, you know, people are going to pick up trees here shortly. The NRD has trees to purchase. So the NRCS office is your one-stop shop for the NRD programs where you can get some clarification on those programs and we can plan exactly what you need. So if you've got any inquiries about any programs, do stop at your local NRCS office and they'll help you out. Um, that's what I'm here for. So. Thanks again for having us, Tyler. Thanks for the opportunity. Fernanda's gonna talk after the break and she's in partnership with us on this project. So it's really exciting to have UNL looking at our data and coming up with some analysis. So stay tuned. Hey, let's thank Aaron and, uh, and John for coming in. So appreciate it. We'll, we'll take a quick break uh, and then we'll be back here. We're gonna, we're gonna start back up at 1045. So we'll make it a, we'll make it a short turnaround.
everyone uh, probably grabbed a, grabbed a few snacks before you sat back down. All right, this last section kind of uh, builds on uh, some of the other things we've talked about and, and more into the, um, you know, some of the, the things that people are doing here in Nebraska on some of these larger farms. And so it's good to have uh, Fernanda Krupek. Uh, she's a, a graduate uh, uh, graduate research at the agronomy department. Is that, I'll yes. let you formally introduce yourself better than me, but uh, she, she's been working with a lot of these demonstration farms over the last year or so, um, kind of trying to bring some of that data and put it to use. And so we're, we're happy to have her here to share some about that. Again, um, feel free to ask questions as you, you know, as you see fit, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her and she can uh, enlighten you all. So thanks for, thanks for being here. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today to share with you a little bit of this learning process that has been working with NRCS, UNL, and the farmers in Nebraska. So a little bit of my background. So my name is Fernanda. I'm a PhD student in the agronomy department at UNL. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil. In 2016, I moved to Florida to pursue my master's degree at University of Florida. And I was a little bit tired of the weather there, so I was like, okay, let's move to Nebraska and start a PhD here. Just, just kidding. But so I started my PhD last summer working uh, in this uh, soil health initiative project. And that's what I'm going to present to you today. So first of all, I'm going to introduce a little bit of the project description and goals. Aaron already touched base on that, so I'll go very quickly on that. And then there are three main uh, aspects of this learning process associated with this project that I would like to touch base, which is the experiential, the technical, and the social learning. So let's go ahead and uh, start with the project. Like Aaron mentioned, uh, there are 17 studies they were assigned either in 2016 or 2017. Those are five years uh, on-farm research on soil health management systems. And this is a voluntary-based incentive technical program, which means that we try to approach uh, the farmer-initiated research questions. So what is your research concern? What is your resource concern? And we allow producers to test what they were interested in, either trying cover crop mixtures or implementing cover crop for the first time. So there are a lot of different components on the soil health that those producers working with us are trying on their own fields. So here, you're already familiar with this map showing all the demonstrations fields we have across Nebraska. Uh, the main uh, objectives of this program is to maintain or enhance soil health by addressing the four soil health management principles that Aaron already mentioned to you. Either maximizing continuous living roots, biodiversity, minimizing soil disturbance, and maximizing soil cover. Um, another objective of this project is to collect all the data to validate the use of the soil health management systems and provide farmers with the opportunity to research those practices in the environmental where they possibly will be implemented. Moving to the experiential um, aspect of this learning process, um, we have been working with uh, amazing collaborators. This is Noah Syme. Um, he has been testing, uh, cover, no, he has a no cover crop strip and he's also testing interseeded and dormant cover crop in his field. Uh, he has over 10 years of experience with cover crops. And last year, uh, his field braved the weather. So remember those floating events that happened? Noah Syme had rye on his field, and he could see the difference that with all the floating, his field came out of after the event, and he could plant it last year, and everything worked well because he had rye in his field. We also have Daryl here. 
that can tell better than me about his experience on that. Um, in part of his field, he's testing a winter hardy and winter kill cover crop. And just to point out, he also has a corn and soybean wheat rotation. Uh, he has been no till since 1987, right there, if you can correct no, me. No till since, yeah, since 87. Yeah. Right. And wheat, too, right? Yeah. And also, we have um, Joe Sack. And one of the most interesting aspects of his story is that when he graduated from college, he wanted to apply the principles of soil health in his own farm. But how he could do that, how he could convince his father in doing that? So he did not. He decided to buy a piece of land, apply those principles, and show to his father that he can build the soil health over time just by applying principles that we already discussed here. <clears throat> OK, so this was the experiential part that I would like to share with you, this learning from practice. Our producers are testing the management on their own field. They are seeing the improvements and can share this uh, with us. The second part is the technical. So we are trying to provide uh, scientific evidence that we have those improvements in soil health in these fields. So I'm, there are three um, topics that I would like to cover here today. The first one is to understand water dynamics under chains in land use and soil type. So last summer, uh, we went to the field and collected sorptivity measurements, which is basically the initial water infiltration rate. And we selected four on-farm fields. And the reason we selected these four on-farm fields is because they are testing cover crop versus no cover crop. So these are the most contrasting management comparisons that those producers are testing on their own fields. So we expect the highest difference on the water infiltration measurements. Uh, one thing to point out is that those fields have different histories of tillage, and I'm going to show that on the data. And another thing is how can we compare these different fields if they have different histories of tillage? So one strategy that we took was to select a reference stage nearby those fields. And what I mean by reference stage is either a pasture or a native uh, vegetation that could show what is the maximum capacity of that soil in that particular area. Those are the reference conditions that I'm going to show in the graphs. So again, our objective was to compare these different crop management systems to a reference stage. So here, you have uh, two locations in Greeley and Colfax County. And again, you will see uh, these different soil types here. Since those fields are uh, large scale fields, there are, sometimes there are more than one soil type in the field. So in order to um, get a valid data on soil infiltration, we separated those fields by soil type. So we collect data on different soil types within the same field to make sure we are not getting any confounding effects with the soil type on the management history. So those are the different soil types in each of those fields. And if you can see, if you go from no, co oh, and another thing I didn't mention, those, uh, those fields, they had, this was either the second or third year of cover crop introduction. So you can see that from no cover crop to the rangeland, which is our, our uh, reference condition, we see a significant increase um, in water initial infiltration. And you see that the cover crop strips, they are here in the middle of the way. So it is getting there over time. Uh, so again, we have uh, this improvement in, with the use of cover crops. The different soil types that I mentioned before, with different soil types within the same field. And like I mentioned before, those fields have different histories of tillage. So this is a field that has been no-till for 10 years compared to this one that has been no-till for 20 years. We don't see a lot of difference on this part, but if we move to this other one, 
where we have strip two and two years of no two, we can see, look at the range here on the y-axis. Before it was 0 0.8 the maximum and here it went down to 0 0.4. So there is an effect of the tillage on the water infiltration rate too that we need to take into account when, when we compare those different sites. So those are the ranges, but again, we still have an increment. And it, you might ask me, what is going on here in Howard County? Well, when we took those measurements, um, it was right after a rainfall event, and we could see that the field was already saturated. So there is also an initial soil moisture effect on the infiltration rate that we need to take into account when we also compare those different fields. So uh, as a take home message on this first data, the initial soil moisture affected the water infiltration rate and should be taken into account when comparing different sites. When we average across different types, soil types and sites, cover crop increased initial soil water infiltration by 59% compared to the conventional farming system, in this case, the no cover cropping. And the long-term benefits of cover crop and soil health management are more evident under reduced soil disturbance. In this case, soil that has not been tilled for many years. The second technical aspect I would like to touch base is on uh, comparisons of soil health assessments between different transitions to soil health management systems in Nebraska. So, like Aaron mentioned before, we have different producers working with us and they are testing different management strategies that are known to improve soil quality. And on those fields, there was a benchmark soil health assessment that was collected in the year one when the project was implemented. And the main soil health assessments that were conducted was the Haney test that most of you might be familiar. And the soil health assessment protocol followed by the NRCS that is comprised most of the physical properties of the soil and they also have a soil respiration um, measurement. So with this project, we want to uh, understand the relative effects of a continuum of practice on a transition to soil health cropping systems. And like I said, those fields were testing different things. How can we compare those different places? We, one approach we took was to develop a matrix score to classify those fields uh, that were undergoing in slow shifts in soil health over time. So those are the, all the fields that we consider in this analysis. So this is a great infograph uh, from a publication that my advisor and her colleague put together uh, comparing infiltration, different management strategies uh, affecting infiltration rate. So just to show here what happening, those producers are applying the principles of soil health. So they are uh, trying to maximize biodiversity either by uh, crop and livestock integration or including a, crop, a third cash crop in the rotation. They are also trying to minimize disturbance using no tillage, maximizing soil cover with cover crop, and maximizing continuous living roots, either by introducing perennial or cover crop. So our strategy to combine all those different management practices intended to improve soil quality was to develop this matrix score. So if you look at the top here, there are those main management practices I mentioned before. So we gave scores either of zero or one. And score zero means that those practices uh, are not intended to promote soil quality. So for example, if you look at fallow and tillage, all those fields that had those practices, we gave a score of zero because it's not promoting soil health. And we did the same for all the other practices. Cover crop, cover crop species, uh, cash crop rotation, grazing. So we gave scores for those fields and then we basically got the sum of each row and that's what this composite rank score here means. 
And if you look at the total scores goes from zero to seven. So the seven is the, let's say, the healthiest soil. Are those fields that are implementing the most number of management practices that promote soil quality. So okay, we have this composite rank here, and then we decided, well, if it goes from zero to seven, if it is higher than seven, it's, sorry, higher than four, this field is going more towards the soil health management systems. If it is lower than four, it's still on the, let's say, conventional soil management. So that's why we gave this um, classification either in soil health management systems or the conventional praxi, which was based on this composite rank score. And then we start to look at all this soil health assessment data that was collected in the field. So there are a lot of, a uh, bunch of uh, information here. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, highlight a couple of them. So for example, bulk density, we have seen a decrease in bulk density, and which is good, which means that we have more organic matter in the soil, is less compacted. Uh, infiltration, we have seen improvements uh, in infiltration rates and Again, soil porosity here. So all this last column here is showing us this uh, difference, which is on the, the greens one, means that soil health, uh, soil health management systems outperform the conventional one. And in um, red one are those where the conventional outperform the soil health management system. So in overall, you can see a lot of uh, Green here means that the soil is, is improving. We are, those management practices are improving the quality of our soil and we, we see that on all those different properties. So though, these are the data from the NRCS soil health assessment and there is also the Haney test that collect a lot of uh, soil chemical properties and we have also seen uh, improvements in soil respiration, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and for example here, organic nitrogen release. So this was one approach uh, we decided to take in order to compare these different um, soil properties in these in this different management systems. And uh, like you can see here, there are a lot of soil properties that those soil health assessments are collecting data on. And there, those different soil properties, they are correlated to each other. They are not, they, there is some uh, interaction between these different soil properties. And that's what this, um, this graph here is showing us. So the closest to one, minus one or one, means that the strongest is the correlation between the variables. So for example, soil temperature and infiltrations that's what all those here is showing correlation between temperature and all these other soil properties. So you see here that there is a lot of correlation between these different soil properties. And we can take advantage of that using a more sophisticated statistical methods to see how these different field composite ranks, they cluster together into groups and what is the relationship between these different soil properties with these groups? So here is just a preliminary data, but I wanted to show you that with the different composite ranks here, zero, two, five, six, which are based on that matrix core I showed you, we can classify those fields and see what are the, the properties that are most influencing this classification. So for example, here uh, the fields classified as zero or two, those are the lowest score in terms of soil health. And those fields, you see here bulk density, most likely because those fields have a low bulk density, the soil is compacted. So this is the, man this is the property that is influencing the most the classification of these fields in lower score. So again, this is more, kind of more complex data and we are still figuring out what is the best way to interpret that because 
there are many um, association between these different soil properties, but I just would like to show you what we have been doing so far. Yes, yeah, so again, here we see the clustering, the low scores, and then we have the higher score here clustering together. So as a take home message for the second part, we can see that most of the chemical and biological soil indicators integrated in the soil health assessment were statistically different between the conventional and the soil health management systems. Um, the Haney test, result, the Haney test results in the NRCS soil health assessment showed higher scores or values in the soil health management systems compared to the conventional one. And their results also uh, reflect the legacy and the history of the management. Remember what I said and showed you in the first part of the presentation, how the tillage affected the infiltration rates? So there is also a legacy and history of the field affecting those uh, results we are seeing here. And when we use the, that previous graph I show you, the analysis is called canonical discriminant analysis. So that analysis added on the visualization and interpretation of the main properties that is driving this gradual adoption of conservation farming practices. And these results provides a basis for um, a common framework for soil health assessment in systems level shifts to more regenerative farming systems. Now moving to the third and last part of the technical aspect. Um, the, we are trying to use remoting sensing tools to evaluate the effectiveness of soil health building practice under extreme weather conditions like last year we observed. So this is a field in Howard County. Um, it has a cover crop versus a no cover crop strip designed in spatially balanced blocks. Um, the soil type is a silty clay loam. Uh, the cover crop mixture was drilled in September 2018, which was the second year of continuous cover crop use. Here is the mixture that was used in that field. And uh, before cover crop termination, uh, we collected cover crop biomass, and the average was between uh, three tons per hectare, which is kind of high consider uh, all those other fields we are working with. Uh, cover crop was terminated uh, May, uh, May 14th, and then soybean was planted and was harvested in September 3rd. So we collected a couple of uh, measurements on this particular field. Uh, we have soil samples, uh, we collected soybean yield components and grain quality, and we have multispectral remote sensing data that is weekly collected in this field during the crop growth. And it is a high resolution data, like 17 to 20 centimeters spatial resolution. So I collected some weather data from a weather station nearby this field in order to see um, how this the, the precipitation and temperature varied compared to previous years. So what I'm trying to show here, we have here the average temperature and average in cumulative precipitation during the crush crop growing season. And here we classify the, the years either in warm and dry, warm and wet, cold and dry, cold and wet, based on the average the 10 year average cumulative precipitation and average temperature. So you can see here that last year was very different compared to all these other years here. It was extremely warm and wet. So the question is how this field with cover crop experiments in place for two years responded to these atypical torrential rains during the cash grow crop growing period compared to the soils that were left bare? So here's a, a thermal imagery data. 
that was collected from weekly from July 3rd until July 14th. And if you look at this, you see that there are different patterns develop in the field. You see that the no cover crop is uh, cooler than the areas with cover crop history. And there are a lot of hypotheses I try to formulate when I look at this data. I was trying, what is going on in this field? What is happening? And what is good about this uh, imagery data is that we are collecting either weekly to biweekly data. So we can observe over time what is going on with the crop because sometimes the total yield data will not tell us what happened during the crop growth and development. So when we look at this, the NDVI data, which is a vegetation index that is related to crop growth, to crop vigor. So during that time that this thermal imagery were taking, you see here that the areas with cover crop, the NDVI was lower. So the plants were not, the canopy was not as closed as the areas with history of no cover crop. And then later in the season, you see that the cover crop has a higher NDVI than the area without cover crop. So I was kind of interested about that, was what is going on in the field? So we went back to the field to see what was happening. And if you see, this is a couple days before harvest. You see that the areas with cover crop history, the plants were not, uh, did not senescence as early as the areas without cover crop history. And if you look at the yield data, the yield data does not show any difference because you look here, all the p-value is higher than 0.05, which means there is not a statistical ev evidence to show difference between the two treatments. So when we also got information on grain quality, because I saw that there could be any difference on the grain quality, but there was also no difference. And we are still uh, trying to figure out what is the best approach to evaluate this data because uh, there is a cover crop effect on that field. There was, the plants were not in the same, let's say, uh, stage, growth stage, but the yield did not show differences. So that's good to have this kind of uh, imagery throughout the growing season because even though the yield data was not showing difference, something is going on in this field with cover crop history. We don't know if it is a water aspect, if it is a nutrient aspect, but something is going on that is showing different between these two management strategies. So as a take home message, uh, high resolution multispectral imagery were collected throughout this um, multiple points on the growing season and can provide a detailed information on how management decisions and weather conditions um, events affected the cash crop. And like I said, the treatments did not show yield difference, also uh, grain quality or soybean moisture. How are we in time? Oh, okay. Finally, I would like to touch base on the last aspect of this learning process, which is the social aspect. So producers are learning from other producers' experience too. So last year, we had uh, our annual meeting uh, where we got together with the producers involved in this project. They shared the exper their experience, what they have been learning, what they are most interested in, what are the unanswered soil health topics. So it was a great opportunity to know from them uh, what they are most interested in, how can we make improvements. And this year, we... Oh, here are some of the highlights from last year. So on overall, the producers enjoyed that experience to get together and hopefully uh, we'll have the same experience this year too. Like Aaron mentioned before, this is, will be on the 28th of February and this is a draft of our agenda. Um, we will have a keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Ray Dreiber. She'll be talking about uh, the microbial perspective uh, of soil health. 
I'll be also presenting a little bit of our uh, progress and we will have the producer sharing their experience, their own project and their results. With that, I would like to thank you and I'm glad to take any questions you might have. Yeah, if anyone has questions, and will you just repeat the question when you answer it? Sure. Question, uh, how much do you gain by going to a multi-species rather than a single species? You mean biomass? Yeah. So, so the question is uh, how much we gain in biomass by uh, planting either multi-species or a single species. In terms of numbers, I honestly don't have the number. If Aaron, do you have any? So a couple studies that we are doing are trying to get right at that. But the results, we, we're just starting to take clipping data. And so we don't have those. Um, but anecdotally, um, and through some other research, we can kind of pinpoint that a monoculture of grass has a lot higher potential to grow biomass than a mixture that includes some other broadleafs that just like clovers and flax. Some of those plants just don't grow biomass. But like I mentioned before, we're really interested in what's going on underground versus visually above ground. We're not so keen on having to see a golf course out there if we have really good root structure and biological activity. So I just throw that out there. But there are a couple studies. The one in Odo County is looking at diversity. The one here in um, Seward County is looking at diversity. And there is uh, Stanton County has a monoculture versus a mix directly, that, that uh, trial. So. And uh, just another point, we also need to take into account when was planted and the seeding rate we have. So those fields have different seeding rates too, so we cannot compare the different fields, but... But one versus the other. Yeah. Larry? Are there also in those days, are they going to be measuring the nutrient uptake with the different, uh, the radishes or the turnips or the rye tape? So the question is, are we going to measure the nutrient uptake for the different... Um, strips cover our monoculture versus mix and th there are we're taking soil samples in those strips per strip and so we're going to be able to look at that um, and, and see what that is there is a nutrient study in one of these demonstration farms in Franklin County they're actually doing a zero application versus a bell curve of, of nitrogen and trying to analyze how much the cover crop provides and when and where so just that that study's getting a little more uh, focus as well, so. Have you looked at it all if, by doing the cover crop, when you terminate it, if you have to increase your planting rates to stay at a final stand count that you're looking for? As far as um, stand count and, and the, the effect of the cover crop on the stand count and, and ha if we need to increase seeding rates. Yeah, and um, when and if termination date has an effect on that. Um, some of these studies have stand counts in them, and we're, we're not seeing that if, if it's managed well, um, but definitely cover crops can Im impact um, emergence, and especially in corn. Um, but in soybeans, I think we're seeing that it's playing out just fine. Um, but no, I don't think we have specific exact information to what you're saying um, being pulled out of these, but I think you could derive an answer by looking at the on-farm research results. So I hope that answers your question. The interesting thing about uh, cover crops and some of the misconceptions we have is um, soil temperatures in the spring, the, the lowest temperature that we achieve day in and, and night, day, night, day cycles the lowest temperature is really what dictates when we can plant. And in a cover crop field, the dips are a lot smaller and it stays a lot more consistent and typically warmer than a, a conventionally tilled or more bare soil um, field. Although the highs are higher in a tilled field, the lows are lower. And so we can keep a much more consistent temperature and moisture level. And so that then that's a benefit later on um, in the season because we haven't lost all of our soil moisture to higher soil temperatures. And we can still plant basically, give or take, somewhat at the same time. And so we're seeing 
that play out a little bit differently than we expected. And Rogers Memorial Farm has a lot of uh, soil temperature um, instrumentation on it, so some of that data comes from Paul Yalza. Yes? Okay. On cover crops, we're, what we're doing is cereal rye after corn, and then nothing after beans. We're the first in that are doing uh, cover crop uh, every year. Were you getting twice the benefit, or were you getting four times the benefit because you're losing some uh, now by having the cover crop each year? So, like I said, that Fremont County, or up by Fremont, Dodge County, that farm is testing just that, and the results are showing there's a pretty big difference. You know, I don't know if we could say it's double or, you know, exponential or what it is, but there is a difference between those two strips. And, you know, you can walk out there and the one that's continuous cover crops, but we, we also added wheat. That's a big difference. It's like walking on a mattress. And then when you're in the corn bean with just cover crops after beans, it's still just pretty firm. You just are in a typical crop field feel. But when we get fluffy soil and, and a lot of biological activity, that's when we're changing that soil structure long term. So that's ultimately the goal. So you're seeing the most effect on a three crop rotation? We do. We see a big rate of change. And if, if we could just do that once, I'm convinced that would make a change in your soil. But it's the cover crop after wheat that really has a growing season effect and those warm season roots and that, that photosynthetic activity that we can really accomplish work underground. The longevity of that work and the amount of biomass underground really impacts soil structure. So it's, it's about the time in, in place. I was just out of uh, the No-Till on the Plains conference um, down here at Wichita, Kansas this week, and a presenter there said that the fungal relationship really becomes finalized after three to four months of a cover crop being in place. So if we're not achieving three to four months of, of cover crop growth, then we're not quite achieving the completion of that relationship where they'll form spores in the root structure. So we are facilitating fungal growth, but not as much as we could if we don't leave that cover crop in place. So that was interesting to hear from him and, and just think about how long can we leave that cover crop there. So if you're doing it, putting the cover crop after wheat, and so we, it needs to be killed before, say, it, it So most, most of the time, cover crop after wheat, we're going to grow something that's going to frost kill okay. anyway. And then our spring burn down of any winter annuals or, or regular herbicide treatment would, would and should kill any brassicas that survive the winter. And I think that's something we've seen in Daryl's field um, is that sometimes there's survivability that we didn't expect of these winter kill cover crops. So that's an interesting question. But usually that affords you a great opportunity to just frost kill it and graze it. Back to Larry's point. That, that cover crop after wheat is a really big opportunity to put some grazers in there after that first frost to get a pretty good balanced nutritional uh, feed source and a little bit of uh, return, immediate return on the investment. So that is allowed. It is, yep. And a lot of these farms that we're talking about here have grazing involved. Um, in fact, Knox County is a grazed versus not grazed study to see that if there's any differences. Oddly enough, he has earthworms the size of my left arm. And uh, I would, that's my next question. I was wondering, have we seen uh, any you know, more uh, you know, like earthworms or that type of stuff in the cover crop? So the question is, have we seen any more earthworms or activity in a, in a cover crop field? And absolutely, it promotes earthworm activity and biological activity. What's really, really amazing is that as you improve and increase the volume and actual number of bodies underground, num number of organisms underground. There's data that shows that a healthy soil has about 10 cows worth of biology underground, and those 10 cows have to eat. And so that's 30 pounds a day per cow, times you know, 300 pounds of residue a day that they're consuming. And so managing that living ecosystem requires you to take account of it. And a lot of these, uh, you know, we improve healthy soil just a little bit, and then we start to get bare ground. We can't keep enough carbon on the soil surface. 
And so it really becomes a race, and your management intensity in, has to increase with an increase in biological activity. So it becomes a real trial, or, you know, that's where wheat can really play a big role as you grow a big high carbon cover crop or crop like wheat and corn, and that residue tends to last a little bit longer and slow down the system, which allows fungus to play a part. So the biological activity is really interesting and it's been a, a challenge to manage. I think you talk to anybody trying cover crops and they're going, wow, I'm really cycling my crop residues now. It's a big change but it goes in the soil where it's supposed to be, so. Okay. Well, let's thank Fernanda. And <laughs> thank, thank you both for, yeah, thank you, for, uh, for yeah. coming up here. Uh, I, I'm not a, a soil scientist, but I, as an ag meteorologist, the only thing that I've really learned with this is try to uh, mimic Mother Nature, what it would naturally do in some of these systems. That's the best way to get through some of the weather extremes that we've done is, you know, keep something growing as much as we can and let some cap once in a while and uh, you probably have a pretty resilient system. So, uh, but appreciate you all coming in. Thanks for uh, joining in today. Uh, next week we have one, uh, a sort of a tie on to this, what's on uh, some resiliency and diversification. So a little bit on some, maybe some alternative crops, um, what can go on the ground um, and also maybe some other things building on that resiliency of your soil and your land to make it through some of the things that that we got to deal with in 2012 and 2019. So um, with that, again, thanks for Sarah for sponsoring today, and thanks for our speakers and uh, NRD for coming in, and uh, we'll see you all next week.